Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times. Welcome to the Times Talk's 20th Anniversary Festival. Yay. <clears throat> For 20 years, Times Talks has showcased world-class journalists and creative thought leaders who've used the arts, sciences, and public office as a lens for change and a platform for conversation. All this weekend, Times Talks will convene the brightest and most seminal voices for a series of substantive conversations and entertaining experiences. There's more in store following today's Times Talks. Grab a cup of coffee at Bluestone Lane and visit the Smorgasburg Food Hall downstairs. Browse a specially curated selection of books and New York Times merchandise from the Strand Bookstore pop-up shop and explore the Absolute Art Times Talks 20th Anniversary Collection. And after all that, take a well-deserved break at the Design Within Reach Lounge and sink into Molly Finley's Mr. and Mrs. Noodle installation. Now down to business. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first live version of The Corner Office. Newly reimagined this year by business reporter David Gellis, Corner Office is our long-running New York Times Sunday business column featuring, con featuring conversations with leading figures, leading CEOs in business, sports, and the arts. David's special guest this afternoon is Hamdi Ulukaya, founder, chairman, and CEO of Chobani, which became the number one selling Greek yogurt in the United States in less than five years. A devoted humanitarian, he has defied the odds and created a model for 21st century leadership. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, corner office moderator, uh, columnist, David Gellis, and our special guest, Chobani CEO, Hamdi Ulukaya. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here with Hamdi. Uh, I've been a business reporter for 10 years, and uh, you can imagine I've met my share of CEOs. And rarely do you get someone with the, the full package, uh, a really inspiring personal story, authentic engagement with social issues, and, and unquestioned business success. Uh, so we're delighted that Hamdi's here, especially because eight days ago, Hamdi welcomed a new boy into this world. How are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for bringing me here today. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's a good thing that you're not home, or, or if so you don't I even said, know where you are. I really have to go to this New York Times thing. It's <laughs> It's extremely important. Um, and how long is it going to take, she says. I think it's going to be about nine. And um, so I live a little bit of time for a beer with my friends you know, <laughs> before I go back. Uh, it's, it's just a miracle. I mean, you have your kids, and I'm sure a lot of people here um, have it. Um, it's been seven days of you know, most beautiful feelings that you can you can ever go through, so. Good, yeah. good, and congratulations. Well, y you're not back at work no. last week, and you're not back at work next week because you are taking parental leave. Yes. You're taking two weeks now, and you'll take another four weeks later in the year. Now, that's unusual for many men in the workforce today, but especially a CEO. Yet everyone at Chobani today gets six weeks of parental leave, men and women. Yeah. Why did you institute a policy like that? That happened um, after my first son's uh, you know, birth. I, I really was not paying attention to the, you know, this topic before. Um, and then when Aga was born and I was going through that experience and I just started wondering how a mom goes back to work and how mom does it without a father being there. Um, I just was shocked by the experience. And then I immediately called Grace, who's one of the key figures, a key leader in the company. And she just had a baby. I said, Grace, how is our parental policy? And she said, well, we don't have one. Um, <laughs> we just have what the state and the insurance you know, provides. And I said, well, can we look at this and see you know, how are the industries doing, what are they doing? And it has, uh, you know, I got to tell you, David, we, the things that we found out with the search, I mean, in technology and you know, in that world, it, things are a lot better. But when it comes to manufacturing and vast majority of the business environment, 
this parental leave is, is, is pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, there's not, um, I would come to a level of saying it's unhumane, basically. So we immediately look at it and we brought for fathers and mothers and you know, partners, whoever, having babies or adopting or foster child, uh, whichever the conditions are. And we did it full paid. And most importantly, we came to understand that it's not only parental leave, the parents leave, then they worry what happens to job after. So that emotional you know, weight on when they are there, how do you make them comfortable when they are with their baby, that their job is secured, and when they come back. So we created this informative things, which you don't have to respond, you don't have, it's just it's informing you that once in a while, this is what's happening in your department. Um, I took it because I meant it, um, and so this is my second week, and then most of the fathers, they do first two weeks and then you know, periodically moms, they took all of it. Um, <laughs> so I mean it, I didn't realize everybody else in the company means it too. I had not received one email, one text, nothing. And I finally mm -hmm. called Nishan yesterday, I said, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important week that's going on in the company. Actually, um, I don't know if it becomes public or not later, but it's probably one of the most important event is happening at Chobani mm -hmm. in the last two, three years and I'm totally disconnected. Mm. That's how much we mean about the parental leave, mm. yeah. Wait, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a news reporter, I need to know. Well, nothing happened yet. <laughs> it's, it's the developments that are happening and the innovations and stuff like that, but I am highly involved in that, but because, you know, my, Miram born, and I'm disconnected totally, and companies is going on. People Great. are functioning. That's, that's and, and this cannot just be, uh, for the show, it's just, uh, you have to mean it, and we encourage our people, take it, disconnect it. This is the most beautiful time a parent can experience. Be with your child, and when you come back, you'll be happiest, and we'll benefit from that too, because you come rest, you can come for... In, in other way, if you look at it from the business perspective, if someone goes to work right after the baby is born, how is he going to be productive? How is he going to function? Yeah. I mean, that's just not possible either. That's you know? great. Yeah. Well, as you'll hear, Chobani has very progressive employment practices across a range of issues. But as Tom generously mentioned, this is the first live corner office. So this will actually become a print column in the New York Times later this year. And corner office uh, covers a lot of ground. We talk about personal history. We talk about business success. We talk about leadership and values. And we're going to get to all that in the next hour. But I want to start all the way at the beginning. Hamdi, let's talk about your upbringing in Turkey. Your parents were dairy farmers. You raised sheep as a boy. Yeah. What was it like growing up there? Um, huh. I, um, I'm from Turkey, eastern part of Turkey, uh, northeast. It's, it's Colorado weather, you know, um, snow, mountains, um, and then beautiful spring, and you know, uh, and as Kurdish um, nomadic, we were nomads. We would go up in the mountains with herds and sheep and goats and cows and make yogurt and cheese and and come back in the in the winter back to the village, back to the um, town and villages. Um, so there is not a day goes by I don't travel back to my childhood. I mean something. Upstate is a lot easier because you know you go to a farm, you see a smell, you says, "Okay, it smells like my my cow." <laughs> uh, uh, it, there's not a day that you don't go back. Uh, my mom was extremely important figure in our in our bringings. Um, the community was extremely strong, David. I mean, th th there was not a law that it was protecting it. It was just uh, this community sense of being part of community gave so much security and safety that we grew up not worrying about anything, basically. Um, money didn't mean much, because up in the mountains there was nothing you could buy with it. Um, and if I give you an example, if somebody's, we all have 100, 200, 300 sheep, and that's your wealth, that's where you grow, that's what you bring food for your family. If barn burned or something happened, a wolf attacked your, your, your herds and you lost all of them, each family will bring one and the next day you would have all your sheep back. Oh. And that's, and but the one that, each family that brings one to them, they pick the best one. They don't bring just the okay one. So that's, that's kind of, 
you know, we lived under the tents up in the mountains. You didn't have guns to protect yourself. I mean, it was, it was simple. And I grew up listening to shepherds. I grew up with shepherds. I grew up hearing their stories. And I grew up watching my father, you know, conduct his small businesses and buying cows and sheep and selling it in other big cities or making cheese or selling yogurts. Um, and then later on, I went to boarding school. I, I went away from home when I was 11. Uh, this was a boarding school that you would become a teacher in the end. And I was there for f five years, you know, coming back to home summer and winter every once in a while. And I didn't finish it and I left, came <laughs> back to home. Um, then later on, I, there was this figure in the town, it's the mayor or government appointed person that runs the city. I said, I'd like to be that guy. So, so I went to school to become that guy. Uh, and then I left after two years because I published a newspaper and you know, being a Kurdish activist and all that stuff, got into trouble with the uh, government. And one day I said, I should leave. I should go somewhere in Europe. This is not livable anymore. And one stranger said, why don't you go to America? Mm. And until that person told me, I never thought about America because we thought America was source of all the problems <laughs> in the world. Uh, <laughs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> uh, you know, the imperialists and all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> and then I came back to that guy again. He was a customer in a, in a small shop we had. And he said, you could just go for a university. Hmm. And that's basically that strangest recommendation. I went to the embassy. They gave me a visa. And in 1994, I was here, end of 1994, yeah, yeah. with a little bag and $3,000 in my pocket. And a few months later, I went upstate, uh, worked in a farm. Uh, and the first thing you started making was feta cheese, is yeah, that right? Yeah, exactly. So you came to, to, to learn about business, in part, is my understanding? I came to learn English, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought I was going to be in the field of business at, mm. at all. Like, if, if you asked me that day, I didn't know what I was going to become. Uh, Let alone uh, someone who worked in the dairy industry, exactly. perhaps. So I, I, I had no idea that I would be in this field because the picture I had, the business people uh, in Turkey was completely different. We had these people in their suit and ties and think better than everybody else. And I basically didn't like those people at all. And I didn't want to become one of them. Um, so that evolved my, my, my father came here and said, you should make ch cheese here. There's no good feta cheese here. And this was a breakfast conversation. I said, well, why would I do that? I mean. You know, I didn't come from 2,000 miles away to make exactly <laughs> what we were making back home, you know, together. And that suggestion of my father basically became um, my first business experience in, uh, in Fulton County in uh, New York, Johnston, mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. And how did it go? Was it a successful business making feta? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, you, you put milk into the vats and you put the rennet, you cut it, you stir it, you put them into the forms, and then 24 hours later, you put them into you know, salty water, and then you wait for a little bit later, and then it becomes this hard, semi-hard, beautiful feta cheese, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> in reality, nothing works. Um, two years of struggle. Um, I thought I was running out of business every single day. Mm. I, I remember, and I, I can joke about this too, I remember going, there was a creek right next to this little plant, and I had about 25, 30 people working for me at the time. And I would go there and cry and cry and cry. I'm like 27, 25, I don't know how old I am. It's like, what did I do? Why did I get into this? And, and how am I gonna pay for these people? How am I gonna pay for the milk? Um, and I don't remember what happened, what I did next day. But you know, it was a survival. But I will tell you, everything that I did at Chobani, I learned it during those times. Mm. Everything, it, it was my school. It was very difficult. And there I saw the ad that said that plant was for sale. And so if, if, how did you get there? How did you get from crying by the river to then seeing this ad for sale? And the ad was for? Uh, fully equipped yogurt plant for sale, asking for $700,000. OK. And? To get that, I suspect you didn't have that money in your no. back pocket, so you had to take an $800,000 mm. loan out. Well, that was like, this crime was in the first year or two, and then th 
but it comes. Oh, so this. you'd stop crying by the time. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. That? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was actually saying, you know what? I should, I should move to Saratoga Spring. It's a nice town. Maybe it's nice drive, 30, yeah. hour, 30 minutes. And I was looking for an apartment to rent or something like that. I, I could breathe. I could mm. go to a restaurant or I could have a drink or somebody or you know date somebody. Um, <laughs> and and then the ad arrived. Yeah. Uh, I literally throw it into garbage can. I, I just, these are, these are the time that you, you don't know how your desk is. My desk is just piles up for a week or two, and then I pick a day, and I go in, and I clean up everything, and then, you know, it just does it again. So that was the day, and I was going through all the junks, and I saw this, I throw it, and then about 25, 30 minutes later, I picked it up, and it's mixed with all my tea remainings and cigarettes or whatever it is, and I, <laughs> And I called the number, it was about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening, and the, and the real estate agent said, it's $700,000, it's Kraft, is closing it. And I'm looking at the pictures, there's something is wrong with the, what I see in the picture and with the price, because I know what the stainless steel tanks and fillers and what they cost, it costs quite a bit. Um, and I didn't ask twice because I didn't want to sound like I'm surprised how cheap it is. <laughs> And I went there, Rich, who is still at the plant today, he gave me the tour. Um, and on my way back, I called my attorney and I said, Mario, I saw this plant. It's, it's really cheap. It's $700,000, big. For me, that time, it was big. And he said, what is it? He said, Kraft. What does Kraft do? Yogurt? They close? Yeah. OK. And you want to buy it? Yeah. Okay, he just, he just keep asking me questions to remind me something, but I'm not getting it. And he said, look, they're looking for an idiot Turk to unload this, as is. <laughs> is it junk? Uh, you probably have so many environmental issues. You're buying as is. And, you know, if they thought the plant was anything, they would have not closed it, one. And if they thought yogurt was a good business to get in, they would have not get out of it. This is the biggest company, you know, food company, one of the biggest food company in the world. So when you hear this wise guy telling you all those things, and you say, you know what, it's right. I mean, it's just, who am I? I don't even have money. I mean, <laughs> so I would call him back the next day. Just, I couldn't sleep, and I would call him back, and says, Mario, yeah, but, you know, I don't know what it is, but there's this, I feel like I can do something with this. He said, he said the obvious. He said, Hamdi, okay, let's assume that you could do this, but you don't have money and you haven't paid me for the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, huh? <laughs> uh, then, then I said, okay, we gotta find a way. What? <clears throat> there was this two gentlemen from Key Bank, local bank, and said, Hamdi, there is this program at the SBA, and if they support this project, then we will support the rest of it. And they made it happen. And by August 17, 2005, I had this key for the factory. Um, and I had hired the first four people from, mm. from, the, uh, from the old plant. They had 200, and they had 55, and then they closed it. From the 55, I picked the first five, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. first five. Mm -hmm. and, and did you know how to make yogurt? I had the general idea, yeah. I didn't know, <laughs> 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 I didn't know how to make it in a factory environment, but in a small uh -huh. production environment, I knew the idea. But that was the thing that it was happening. I was seeing these European yogurts that are coming in, and I'm looking at the quality of the yogurt on the shelf. It's pretty awful. Because uh, rewind, this is 2005 at this point? 2005, yeah. And, and Greek yogurt represented what percent of the market at I'd that time? I'd say probably less than half percent. Less than half a percent exactly. of yogurt was yeah. Greek yogurt. And you could only find in like Whole Foods or stores in New York City or some other places, yeah. And, and today, how much of the yogurt market is Greek yogurt? It's uh, 50%. 50%? Over 50%, yeah. And Chobani represents what part of that? <clears throat> Quite a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Peter is, I'm looking at it. We, we have about 20% 20 20 of total yogurt. So it's about 40% of the Greek yogurt. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So even though you didn't maybe know how to make yogurt, that first day you, yeah. you figured well, something well, out. Well, Peter, David, we, we did two years. I was in the factory for two years with my yogurt maker, every single day making yogurt and 
and you have to wait 30, 35 days for the dish to see if you did something right or wrong because the shelf life, you have to look at the end of the shelf life. And cultures are amazing things. The cultures that you put in the yogurt that develops taste, it, it develops texture, um, mouthfeel, um, all of that. And if, if you don't have the right combination of the culture, the end is going to be horrible. And the only way to do it is you have to keep trying it. And then the temperature makes a difference. So if you do it with this combination of the culture, with this temperature, you might get a different result than this, you know. And we wanted to do it completely natural, so we didn't want to cover it with some kind of other stuff. Um, so it took me two years. Mm -hmm. uh, from the cup design, uh, yogurt, uh, like even the simplest equipment, so uh, the separators and all that stuff. So it took me two years. Two years. Of, yeah. And why did you call it Chobani? What does that mean? It means shepherd. Shepherd. Uh, yeah. And, and I just mentioned separator. I was driving, I don't know if anyone does, I was driving from Chicago with this minivan from Chicago to Madison, Wisconsin to go there and buy this used uh, equipment that is necessary to make yogurt. And at that drive, I came up with the name Chobani. Mm -hmm. It's a God's drive in there. It's all um, very quiet. There's not much in the radio. Um, a couple of Christian you know, radio shows. <laughs> uh, you're bored, you, know, you don't know what to do. And finally, I started thinking about the names. And then by the time I came back from Madison to Chicago, I went to my hotel room, look at Chobani.com, it was available. I said, I got it. After, after that. So that was, the, that was the story of coming up with the name. Fantastic. So then from 0% of the market to, to, to close to 50 or more percent, there must have been tremendous growth over those first years especially. Can you tell us about the early days of the company and what were some of the mistakes you made? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think thinking back this 2005, 2007, and these few people that, you know, we are surrounded ourselves, um, that the doubt is not only with the workers that they lost their job or the community, doubt is also in me, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this large company, Kraft, left. This plant closed after 90 years. This is the last plant closed in that community. So the morale is, is pretty low. Um, and people see examples in Binghamton and all the other areas of what has happened. So there's not much optimism in there. Um, and the resources they can see, I mean, I don't have a lot of resources. This is not a rich guy coming in and starting this factory. So there's not much to hold on to in there. Um, we made the first yogurt. It took us eight hours to fill 300 cases of yogurt. And we, we ship it to Log Island. Uh, to a small kosher store, um, I don't remember the name, and we, we put it on the shelf and we waited for a whole week to see if anybody's going to buy it. And a week later, they called and they said, we would like to order another one. I mean, 300 cases <laughs> is like, um, you know, today we do, in every 30 seconds, we do one pallet of yogurt. Like, imagine how, how little that is. Very nervous, but what I found out is that optimism and that strength of the community people was mixed with what I, my background, and we were just resilient. We were, we, 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 we were ready to go, mm -hmm. and, and it's been two years. Um, we found a way to buy fillers. We found a way to get used, you know, separated. We found a way to get milk. I mean, with the very, very limited resources, we found a way to make this happen to this level, and this was a circle time. And then when the retailers start saying, we love this, and I see the potential, and then I start questioning, how, do I, how am I going to get some more resources to be able to produce more? I really don't remember the details. What I, what I can remember to tell you is from that first eight hours production, which is fall of 2007, to 2012, in the, within five years, we went from those handful of people to thousands. And we went from 300 cases to 2 million cases of production. A month. And we went from that zero to a billion in sales within that five years. 
And I, I look back and I said, how did we do it? How did, how did we, and we didn't bring any other investors inside. We didn't brought, we, didn't, we never brought any big equities and all that during that time. We never looked at it from logical perspective to things. We were really elevated. Like, like we were in an unreal place mm -hmm. and nothing was going to stop us. And what I said, us, that I never thought this plant was my thing, that I am studying this. I said, I am part of this community, and we're going to start this together. This old, broken, closed factory, and we're going to fix this. And maybe by fixing this, we can fix ourselves, and we can all take something out of it. Because everything else has gave up on us, and we had, nothing, we had not proven anything in our life yet, based on out. And with the same people who closed that factory, with the same people who lived in that community, and me, who have never done this before, and some retired people that came back to that factory, we innovate the product, we innovate the packaging, we found a way, and it will be crazy to think that it was only me. Crazy, impossible. I know in the computer you might be able to, but in the data manufacturing, impossible. But how did we do it? We never took weekends off. We celebrated Thanksgivings and Christmas and New Year's Eve in the factory. And we never forced ourselves, we said, we have to do it. We all voted. We said, yes, we're going to keep going. And we became one with the community. And by the time we woke up, we didn't realize what we have built. We really didn't. And things were just happening. We were making decisions in the air, and we were just moving. And every time they came, they asked me questions and say, keep going, keep going. Now, one day, it was, I think, 2011, <laughs> and the bankers wrote me a letter and said, you're approved for 250 million line of credit to use whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I'm still eating at Frank's Pizza. I'm sleeping <laughs> every day almost. I'm sleeping in my apartment in Utica, uh, I mean, it's, the dorms are much better than that at that time. Um, and I have this letter, and it seems unreal. And I made a simple calculations, and I said, wow, 250 million. Um, so I'm, I'm about to give you this offer to this company to purchase, but that means they can give me 250. I said, 250. So if I spend $1 million every month, this will last about 40 years. <laughs> And how do I spend $1 million every month? I mean, that's a different big problem, but it's a problem. I started to materialize that is that what we have done is something has a monetary value to it that we should be never looked at it until at that moment I never looked at it that perspective. And it took me 15 minutes and I sent a letter. And because we were, we were just in heaven, but at the same time, it was probably one of the most difficult time of our lives mm. that we were going through. And I have seen in that five years, it was so short, that from that cemetery feelings, like you feel like somebody died and this is a whole cemetery town, to these trucks, drivers, factories being built, farms are pumping milk, and we're finding milk coming from Vermont until the farmers can keep up. Contractors in everywhere, roads are being built. I mean, these houses are being built. You just see it. Everything is happening right in front of your eyes. That was one of the most magical thing I've ever seen in my life, mm -hmm. seeing this town turn around. And you said that you were having to make decisions on the fly. Some of those decisions maybe took a while to get around to, such as parental leave. Yeah. But there were other decisions that y you seemed to get right early. You seemed to have this connection with your employees. You started paying generous wages. You could have gotten away with a lot less. Why did you do that? Why did you, from the outset, go above and beyond and not just pay minimum wage, which you know, uh, sad as it may be, people would still maybe have been grateful for in a depressed economy. Yeah. Why did you go that next level and start offering quite generous uh, leave and health and benefits and compensation policies? I, um, yeah, I, I, look, I mean, uh, my background is a working class background. I, I did not fo want to follow the typical, you know, business CEO or business owner type of things for the obvious reasons. The second, uh, 
I grew up in a place where things were a lot valuable than the money, the, the safety, the well-being of the community sense, mm. and and it, it was in, very dominant in my life. And my mother was extremely extremely uh, powerful on that on that sense. So then you you go upstate, and you're associated with farmers, factory workers, um, you know the community people right there. And you ask the early question, the early days. Um, I still have it. My white coats. I'm in the factory. I'm I'm packing. And then I'm on the phone um, with some other stuff. Uh, so I was a factory worker. So I saw how people left their families to come to receive the milk on Saturday and Sunday, or how they were late to their families. So they, they contributed as much as I did on the success of this. So the question is, are you going to see it or not? It's not if they deserve it or not. Are you going to recognize this or not? So certain things. Okay, I make a calculation. If you make seven, eight, nine dollars an hour, forty hours, let's say fifty hours with the overtime. Let's say your wife works that much. It still doesn't Matt doesn't make it. You can't have a house. You can't have a good food for your kids. I mean, you can't afford. Forget to go on vacation. It, it, it's just the math doesn't make sense. So, if I am not going to start acting upon people who built to make this happen first to them, it just, from the standards that I've discussed, it, it would be unfair. Mm. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to do things that I could continue to do for a long, 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 long time. And that's why, for example, the, uh, some of the shares and all that stuff waited for so long because I didn't want to provide something to the people where a few years later it would, because people make, the, you know, plans based on that. Uh, but one of the, my first dream was to make this company a certain place where everybody's a partner, mm. that they get deserved portion of what they have helped building. And you just mentioned the shares, and, and the audience may not fully understand what you're talking about, but it was such a big deal that we put it on the front page of the yeah. New York Times two years ago. Uh, a couple years ago, you gave away a substantial portion of the company to your employees, yeah. which is basically unheard of in contemporary American business world. But you actually just proactively, without having to, issued shares to all of your employees, including your factory workers. Can you talk, just talk to us about that moment? Yeah, um, that moment was a, another magical moment. Um, I would say my, 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 my first five, my first 50 colleagues, or my first 100, my first 200, um, everybody was in tears, and I think, um, you know, it was, it was captured on some of the pictures. Nobody was shocked, mm. but it's still emotional. Mm. Uh, th not that they knew this was gonna happen because I had to work so hard to make sure that what I was going to do is it can stay for a long, long time and it can be done from the legal perspective. That was a, that was a big battle that even if you want to give, you know, that kind of program to 12 million employees, there's law that didn't allow you to be able to do it unless you hired and paid millions of dollars to lawyers to be able to put, figure this out. So we must make this easy. That's, that's a different topic. What has done to the company is, is like, it, it's not that story is finished, but it's settled. It's okay mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's that feeling that everyone can walk in and says, uh, yeah, I built this. It, mm. I, I made this happen. I made this happen with him, with him, with him, with him, and together we built this. And I, I look at from group, from the bigger perspective, and I, see, I don't see, especially for the rural communities, especially in places where things are a little difficult, I don't see any other way of finding a long-term solution than the businesses are, you know, stepping up. Mm especially for their own employees and, and, and especially for their own communities. Um, this check, you know, box and I'm doing this and this in the world, which is fine, but we have to start worrying about our own employees, their families and their children's well-being and the community and the school that they live in and the fire, fireplace that they, uh, uh, you know, firehouse that they have in town and the and the baseball field that they have in town, we gotta start worrying about those things. And it's not like this is the company's providing, it's the steam in that town that 
creates this environment and, and, and the sponsorship of that company who is combined of the people who works in that town, that ecosystem has to work. Otherwise, depending on governments and depending on you know, this fluctuation of political ups and downs and affecting people's life is, is, is pretty brutal. Yeah. And, and I see it with my plain eyes, especially when you go to town like you know, Norwich, New York, or you know, Tulum Falls, Idaho, or you know, the places like that, I can say, what, are, what is gonna happen to me? And this is the one that the businesses, especially the, do the manufacturing side, um, and, and this places, it's gotta step up. And, and I promise you, it's not a burden on business. It doesn't add any cost. What happens at Chobani has always been that way, but especially after this, we became this unstoppable force. I mean, everybody works in that. It's not like how many hours you've spent, how much you're in, how much passion you have in there, how much you believe in this. And that becomes this amazing force that you get things done maybe 10% of the time of everybody else does. Mm -hmm. You save so much that pays everything in there. The question that comes to the owners and say, what's the difference really if you own the company 40%, 30%, or 80%? What's the difference that makes in the life? What's the difference between one zero this way or one zero that way compared to this? And if you live in places like in Norwich, in places on Twin Falls, and if you live with ordinary people for a long, long time, and if you come, and I'm sure a lot of people are coming from that kind of backgrounds of what's more important in life, and you combine them with the logic of business, this is not a bad, you know, this is not a very difficult decision to make. I have to say, I do not hear a lot of CEOs talking about the firehouses and baseball fields in the towns where their factories are. Yeah. So I applaud you for that. So as you grew, Chobani needed workers, and you looked to an unusual source for employees. Just six weeks ago, I understand, you were in Jordan, yep. and you were at a refugee camp there. And that's because Chobani has made a point over the last several years of hiring not just immigrants, but refugees, refugees to this country um, for your factories. Why did you begin hiring refugees? Um, you know, the, the journey from that town, um, Five, forty, two hundred, thousand, you know, it's expanding, the geography expanding, and expanded to all the way to Utica. And and we can start hiring people from Utica now. And I lived in Utica and, and I heard that there are people are being settled in Utica from different different parts of the world. And it's it's been one of the biggest issues they they're having a hard time finding jobs. And I basically went to the refugee, camp, the refugee center, the, the, the resettlement center, and they said, well, the challenges are we have different, different backgrounds. People come from different, different places. It's, they are legally settled. They don't have driver license. They don't know the language. They haven't done, they've not been through proper you know, training to go certain industries. So these are the challenges, and they're having a hard time. Um, so I said, okay. Let's find solution to this thing. So we start hiring them. Um, of course, my background helps where I come from. I understand what it means for someone to come and settle in this strange country and not knowing the language, not knowing anyone. And I just only imagine how much more difficult if somebody is a refugee. That means you're forced to leave. That, that means that your homes are bombed, or there's famine happened, or you lost your family members, you barely made it, you're one of the one million that made it, you come with so many memories, and now there's another struggle starts here, and maybe you have kids. Um, so with those th things, and I spoke to people at the plant, and I said, well, well let's, let's do this, let's put some kind of transportation, let's put some translators, bring some translators in here, and th that just, started and people in the factory loved it and we became this me and all locals and then it became so many other ones like with me. And uh, what countries were you hiring from? There's 19 different ones. 19 different, different, different countries. languages spoken in Chobani factories now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you should see our family day at Norwich in the summer. It's like literally United Nations. Like literally <laughs> United Nations. And it's, and, and I found out that Twin Falls was also the same as a, mm -hmm. a refugee settlement place. Um, 
and we, we did offer the same exact program to people in, in, in uh, Twin Falls. Um, work for the refugees, I've always said, the minute a refugee has a job, that's the minute they, become, you know, they stop being a refugee. That's, mm -hmm. that's the time they get their dignity back. That's the time that they can go back to their family and say, I'm worth something. I was a doctor there. I'm a factory worker here, but I still come home. I bring bread to the table. I provide to my children. This is the time we start writing our story again. And so many stories are written in Chobani's uh, population of refugees that came to work. Some uh, in the schools in Yale, some, yeah. Uh, uh, you go and it's, 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 it's not, it's very difficult not to get emotionally affected by the story. So that's why, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not the reason from the perspective of labor, community first, people within the community. If I was in Utica, refugees would be part of the community. Norwich, we didn't have it, but when we expanded, it became part of the community. And these people are hardworking people. They've gone through a lot. They made it here, generosity of this country. I hope it continues that way. And have right to work. And we must make them part of the community. And that led me to start thinking about globally this refugee issue, and then I formed my, my foundation. Yeah, I, I want to get there, but yeah. first, I mean, a lot of people find inspiration in what you do. The benevolence of wanting to hire refugees, the uh, recognition that these people are struggling and that a job could really help transform their lives. Yeah. And yet other people really take issue with this. In Twin Falls in particular, in the last year and a half or so, <clears throat> you drew a lot of flack. The alt-right came after you. Breitbart News came after you. Alec Jones of Infowars were not only making salacious claims about some of your employees, <clears throat> but also you in particular, arguing that you were trying to infiltrate the country and bring over dangerous refugees and assimilate them into the population. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, you, you're all human beings. It would be very difficult. It would be not correct if you say you, you get affected by it. You get affected by it for so many reasons. One, um, you know, I know Twin Falls. I live there. I have a house there. Uh, I remember the day one when I went there, shake hands to the mayor and connect with the community people there and the, and the governor. Um, and it was my first time there. And the minute I left from the town, I said, this is what our next plan is going to be. Not because, you know, this and this and I don't, they didn't even have any economic incentive. Because of the connection I made with the people there. The great people, amazing people. And it was sad that all these things were written about that community. It was not true. There was some, small, but majority of the people, most welcoming, honest, hard like steel, real people. So that hurt. Um, the second part was that I was worried about people at Chobani. And I, I, I worried about people at Chobani because it was not a reflection of what was happening in every day at Chobani. Mm -hmm. We were a community. And we were like a family. We had five, six hundred, maybe time up and down. We were all together of the refugees and, and the locals and everyone. And, and I, I was worried that this would get affected by it because of the, all these noise. Um, personally, you know, the truth always comes true, you know, I mean, I, I have to get, my skin needs to get thicker and, and you know, some people don't. But that's why you get affected by it. Um, I walked to my office one day and, and then I think there was a story broke that I was getting some death threats and all that stuff because of this. I look at my table and I don't know if I told this to anywhere else before, I, 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 I saw all these letters on top of my my table, like hundreds of them. And honestly, I didn't know what, what this was. And, and I, I asked uh, you know, uh, my assistant at the time, I said, what are these? He said, these are letters that are coming from all over the country. I said, have you looked at it? I said, we looked at some. And <laughs> there was another crying experience at the time, how tears came to, but these strangers from all over the country writing and reminding you what this country is all about. Yeah. That telling stories of their parents, you know, when things happened in World War II. Um, and 
or in Africa, or how generous this country was, or how they become what they become, or how they're worried about all these noises that are being made. And, and you look at that voice, I look at these others, at that time, my, all my worries were gone. Yeah. Um, I remember this is how we first encountered one another. When this happened, uh, I wrote about it for the New York Times. Yes. And it was one of the most popular stories I wrote all year, not because the alt-right seized on it and tried to make their claims, but because people sympathized and people were supporting the company and supporting yeah. your employees yeah. in, in a pretty profound yeah. way. And the community got together and became stronger. Um, but you sued Alec Jones. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I don't know if we sued him. I thought we did. We, we, yes, I think we did, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know the legal terms, but I guess um, the, I just, I, I said, if somebody comes and tells you something that's not true, yeah. and you try to send them information, you try to tell them it's not true, and if you could correct it, please, and you know, you would do it for your son, I would do it for, your, for my son, I would do it for my family. I don't see Chobani any different than my family. Mm. And I don't see communities any different than my family's community. And if I look at it from that perspective, lawyers get quieter, you know, or the PR people tell less, because I need to defend my honor and, mm. and say that this is not true. Um, and that's the only way we look at it. There's no other way to look at it. Um, you might not like, you know, yogurt that I make. I mean, I'll, uh, sad, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure everything that prove you that it's a good yogurt for you to like, but if you still don't like it, it's fine. Uh, you might not like how you operate, you might not like how I look, you might not have it completely fine. But I think there's a line that yeah. we, we should stay. And, and in, the, in the American politics and news, for the longest time, people stayed within that area. I think the, the area that now is, you know, later on came out in, in Twin Falls, certain stories that came out that it was even certain hands were involved, what was happening in there. It was just this community was caught by all these things were happening. And you go there and says, I have no idea what's going on out there. I have no idea that I look at my news or I leave my phone and look at this and this is not our town. This is not our people. Hamdi's referring to a, an extraordinary story that one of our reporters, Caitlin Dickerson, wrote about in depth in the New York Times Magazine last year. And I'll, I'll refer you to it. It's, it's a sensational, complicated story <clears throat> yeah. that involves Chobani, the people of Twin Falls, Breitbart, and more. So Caitlin Dickerson's piece on Twin Falls is worth rereading. Um, I'll just The mayor no, there has been amazing. The mayor has been amazing. Oh my I spoke God. with him oh my during God. the reporting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just note that Alex Jones did apologize to Hamdi and Chobani. An unusual occurrence, to say the least. So, briefly, Hamdi, what is the Tent Foundation? Tent is, um, after this, I, I get involved with, I went to Geneva, I connected with UNHCR, find out that there's a business angle needed to get into this um, issue of refugees. I mean, we are facing probably one of the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. It's getting bigger, you know. Um, uh, you look at Syria. Uh, funds are getting lower. Conditions are exactly the same as during the World War II. It's, it's pretty brutal. And I said, how can we bring the entrepreneurial angle, the business angle to this? And other than IKEA and a few others, they never, you, know, you don't see the businesses and CEOs and entrepreneurs to come into this field. So it's like, maybe we can bring this together. And, and we started it. We started with five and 10. Now we have 80 companies. And some of the companies include? Uh, LinkedIn, Ikea, Airbnb, Johnson & Johnson, MasterCard. I mean, there's some. And they're committed to do what? Committed to help the, solve the refugee issues one way or another, either hiring, either in, you know, in kind, uh, donations or supply chain or bringing businesses to where the refugee community is. That was the reason I went to Jordan, is just bring work, education, um, you know, living conditions to the places where these populations are living. And how many refugees does Chobani currently employ? Uh, I mean, a lot of them became citizens now, <laughs> you know. Um, I, last I heard, it was about five to 600 people that um, part of our job, 30% of our workers. Mm. 
This is the latest example, uh, or one of many, of business getting political. You've been outspoken on refugee issues, but you also spoke up uh, last year when President Trump instituted his travel ban. You said it was personal to you as an immigrant yourself. And I wonder if you could just <coughs> reflect on the role of business in society today. Is this, is this part of the CEO's mandate now? Absolutely. Do, do you have to take political stances as the head of a popular company? 100%. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, you know, we are living in a place. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it reminds me of um, Martin Luther King. Um, I don't, I don't want to quote it in the exact same way that he said, but silence is, is, is criminal these days. Mm. Being silent is as bad as if you're doing the bad thing. Um, and especially when you are representing a company, if you're representing a brand, representing a community, um, you have to get involved, and you have to raise your voice, and you have to take a stand. Now, more and more companies, you know, you wrote a piece on this, more and more companies are coming up because one, employees want it. Employees and communities want it, you do. Two, your customer wants it too. They do. And three, um, if you don't, you're going to be in a garbage can of tomorrow's businesses. That's what's going to happen. Because consumers are paying attention to what am I buying, who am I buying from, and, 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 and what kind of people uh, and what kind of mindset they have, uh, you know, uh, these this services and products that I'm buying from. It shouldn't be a business reason. It should be a right thing to do. But it's becoming a business reason as well. People are looking into this and say, companies' responsibility to create wealth for the shareholders. And now this new role probably is going to be written and say, create wealth for the shareholders. That's the CEO's role in a long time, in the long term. You know, when you say the long term, that means the social welfare comes in, the social issues and, and, and starts coming into the picture. Um, the third thing is, I think, it's personal. We know we have power. We know we have voice. We know we have audience. And if you don't do it, and if somebody asks you two years from now, you could have said something, you could have done something, and you didn't. Why? Because you thought you would lose money. If you're going to regret that, that's going to be a really bad regret, really bad one. And that's the same applies for the refugee issue, same applies for the civil rights, same applies for the women issue, everywhere. We can't solve all the problems, but we have to make sure that we stand for something. But you can say it and do it in a way that it's not political. Mm -hmm. I have colleagues from Idaho. I have colleagues in upstate New York. They don't have the same political view that I do, or they might not look at the world the way that I look. But one thing that they know, that whatever I say, I say it for real. I'm, I, I, I'm not offending the other ones, but this is exactly how I feel. Mm. And you know, if you look at Idaho, maybe 70% Republican. If you look at New York, upstate New York, Republican. New York, majority Democrat. And Chobani is combined with these two edges of the country. And that does not prevent you from, because you're not political, you're just doing the right thing. Mm. That's the thing, is this the right thing or, right, or not the right thing? Um, I am very encouraged this last year, year and a half, what's happening in the world of CEOs and businesses uh, how they're stepping up, how they're talking about it. And what, I've, what I am really happy that it's becoming a real thing. It used to be, like I said, check the box, like make an ad about it. It's really becoming a real thing. And of course, the newcomers, uh, their DNA is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah. right. I think that's right. I've got one more question for Hamdi, and then we're going to go to questions. There are going to be uh, microphones at the bottom of each aisle. Uh, we're in the New York Times building, so this is your chance to be a New York Times reporter. Get that question, step up, and please, we'll have microphones at the bottom of each aisle in just a minute. So Hamdi, I read somewhere that um, you grew up, and I think you referenced this earlier in the program, you grew up sort of not with the best impression of businessmen. You grew up perhaps, in your own words yeah. previously, hating CEOs. So the question is, what is, Childhood Hamdi, think of Hamdi on stage right now. <laughs> uh, uh, um, 
I think, I think watching every day. Yeah, I, um, I want to stay. The one thing, the worst thing I can do is I'm not going to be this guy. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. It's, it's this water finds its way um, and without too much interruption and you know, touching this stone and looking at I I can't say I've done everything right. I am, I am very lucky to have this journey. It's been one of the finest things that I've been in touch. Um, it brought a lot of pain out. It brought a lot of learning. Um, but, but I say, I make my mothers to watch me um, every day. And I say, would she be proud of me still? That's my <laughs> scale. And I know mothers have a very long tolerance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, 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 I, 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 I think I passed that view that I had that dark face of the businessman, not, not, and this country helped me with that. Well, I think we've learned that business can be a force for good as well this yeah. hour. Yeah. Uh, I hope we have questions. Yeah. <laughs> Please come to the microphone. Here you go. Please, in the green. Hi, I'm Lisa Kelly. Hi, Hi Lisa. Uh, it was great hearing you, and uh, I was here this morning, Katie Kirk was talking about two different communities in the Midwest, one that was embracing uh, refugees and immigrants, and how that was affecting the uh, commerce and the economy of that in a positive way. And I do believe that things are changing, but there's still a lot of box checking. I'm in business, and I hear things like, no good deed goes unpunished still, unfortunately. Um, the foundation is great, I'm wondering, are you hearing from other CEOs that you're talking to in large corporations and or is anybody talking about how we can train other people to maybe take a passion and go somewhere else in the country and make a difference? Because at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't matter how many laws there are when uh, CEOs from everybody from universities and sports teams to major corporations say that they don't care about people's sexual orientation or religion. That's what seems to be speaking. Same with gun control. A lot of laws haven't been passed, but a lot of corporations are making news on how they want to take a stance. How can we take somebody and make it, I don't know, sexy to go to a small town and start a business like you did? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a great question, Lisa. I mean, um, I, I keep saying these small towns are full of gold mines, really. Um, and there are some different opinions that can, can come from one end to another one. Um, but one thing you will find is real people and real hardworking, true community members. And without judgment going in there, and I always said to my colleagues, in, just go pick one and, and just go and see what happens. Um, and the, the approach from, from the community outreach is, in my opinion, is nothing happens with these clashes. It happens once that connection happens in human level. Um, my connection with, like I'm from thousands of miles away from somewhere else. I grew up nomadic life and by the Euphrates River. Uh, I came here without learn, knowing one, and I, one, one word of English, and I end up in a small town in upstate New York. This, this gap is very, very, but I didn't focus on differences. I really focused on similarities that I had with these people. And I found hundreds of them. You know, I found that the, the start from the farm, you know, the way that they care for the, for the animals was similar to what my mother and father was doing. Um, and I found out that the celebration that they had, you know, how they celebrated each other. I didn't get baseball at all because I grew up with soccer. <laughs> but I understood how much that meant for the kids because that's exactly how I was. So I think in any difference in opinions that we go, I, I hope I answer your question uh, in a, this way or I share my thoughts with you, is wherever you go to these small towns, the, 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 it's got to go in a way that finding the similarities first and then discussing the not the similar ones in a really the similar base that we had first. Uh, and then you will find people are 
started to understand each other, and even if they don't support, they don't become you know, complete opposite because they start understanding each other. Um, this is my observations I saw in upstate New York and, and, and Idaho. Uh, but still today, not only it's great opportunities in there, but my message is to all business communities is find a small town that maybe there was a factory that was closed or maybe there was industry is gone and just build on top of that and start magic, start happening. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. On this side, please. Hello, hello. Hi, Hamdi. Hi. Um, so just to piggyback on what you were just talking about, and congrats on your second child. Um, Thank you. For, for those of us that are really invested in the education world and what you, know, you do so, so much for so many causes, as a, as a father and as a leader, um, and automation, you know, so your company is you know, thousands of workers and you know, automation, and when you're working with kids, uh, they're going to be completely different jobs in the future. Um, so now knowing that, for you, in, in being a leader for the business community, what do you think is important for our education, for the children, the social and emotional learning? The, uh, you're, you're really big on community, and, and it's now going to be a worldwide community. Yeah. So w what are you doing, and what do you think needs to be done in, in, that, in that sense? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of discussion going on on what automation is, means, and what tomorrow's factory is going to look like and what kind of education needs to be here for tomorrow's, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I know the, the civilization got nervous about this in so many different times, you know, when the locomotive came or electricity came or automation came. And I think it'll be fine. What worries me the most is the topic that you said, education. Um, and just before I came here, I mean, I'm, my son is year two and a half and and he's just born, and we're talking about schools, right? So, you, you know, that's how it is. We, we worry about those. I, 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 know, I don't think anyone likes how the school's conditions are when it's those rural areas, and, and especially um, near the communities. And this is the most powerful country in the world with endless, endless resources. And I think everyone agrees that the conditions of the schools are not great. The food that is there is not great. Um, the conditions for the teachers are not great. Um, and if we keep not paying attention into that one, and I think we're going to have a really big problem. We start seeing those problems in upstate New York now um, because the students are not being trained for the tomorrow's, tomorrow's need. Uh, there are always jobs, right? So one way or another, jobs are going to be there. The problem is, do we have people for that job? Do we, do we, did we plan on early on to be able to get that job? Um, I really don't know if government is going to be, you know, solutions on these things. Um, I think the industry is sort of getting involved into this. Uh, I mean, you, know, you see some amazing stuff is happening online. It starts happening on technology parts. You know, marrying with the technology. And I was in Jordan. I even saw it in the, you know, the camp people with Jordanians start training people for the job that in the technology world. But this is something that we all need to focus on, we all need to worry about, not only for our child, children's, but you know, the, our communities. Uh, I mean, I'm amazed what Bill Gates is doing in this field. I, I really, um, um, I mean, he's a, he's a mastermind on this one, and he spends a lot of time thinking about what tomorrow's schools in this country. And there are a lot of others, too. I am most worried about school in Norwich, to be honest with you, really, really worried about school in Norwich. So, Maybe there's an angle of Chobani, you know, Chobani or businesses getting involved on that angle too. So, important one. It's our children. It's our future. Yeah. Thank but you. food in the schools is something that just can be fixed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 yeah. we're, we're unfortunately going to have many more questions waiting to be asked than we have time for. I think we've got time for one or possibly two more. So let's go to this side uh, and as quick as we can make it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jerry uh, Hamdi. Uh, I'm wondering if, for this audience and those people watching, if you could uh, expand about uh, what's happening with TPS and people who are refugees who've had status that is now coming to an end in the next year, and if your foundation is lobbying on behalf of those people, or if you just speak to TPS. That. TPS, folks who came because of uh, natural disasters and so forth, El Salvador, oh, I see. Haiti. Oh, I see. Uh, that's all been shuddering over yeah. the last year. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, that is not, that topic was not one of our, um, 
we, we start focusing on first was, do they have enough food? Do they have any sh shelter or do they have in the camps, you know, in the, in the troubled areas? Uh, and then in the long term, we start focusing on, here's, here's, here's the thing, 90% of the refugees are hosted by the countries that the poorest that they are not in Europe, they are not in America, they are in the region, they are in Africa, they are in Jordan, they are in Lebanon, they are in Turkey, they are in Northern Iraq, they are in Ethiopia. And, and resources there are very, very limited. So our, our work, which that topic is also you know, important, I'm sure, we, we start spending a lot of time encouraging companies to help where the issue is, because they want to stay there. They want to stay close to their home, um, and possibly go back to their home one day. Um, but I'll ask our 10 people and see if there is any work has been happening on the people who come here. The, the worst part, people come and their kids go to school. Um, they start becoming part, you know, when they go back, it becomes a stranger place for their kids when they go back. And, you know, uh, so many things to get involved. I don't know uh, uh, what the status on that one, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, on this side, please. Hi. You had talked about how you had this view of America before you moved here. Yeah. And I think that narrative intolerance is only growing. So how do you think we, A, change that, that narrative? And also, did you struggle to convince people that America was a place that they could come and set up their yeah, lives? Yeah, today I do. I actually... <laughs> um, Great question. That's a beautiful question. Um, I say that comfortably because my view has changed so dramatically after I got here. Um, I hope, I wish that I could explain someone, because I'm from somewhere else, what it means this country stay true to its promises, that that doesn't get damaged. Um, yes, economically things are going up and down. Yes, maybe roads are not great. Maybe, you know, this and that. But this, this, this magic that still exists in this country. This cannot be taught to someone. This cannot be implemented by the political system. This cannot be, this, this, is, this goes early, the founding fathers, the reasons, whatever that magic came together, that even today in Norwich, New York, a kid can look at the sky and say, I can, I can do this and I can do that, right? Or someone as strange as, as me, they can come in upstate New York and say, you know what, I can bring that yogurt factory back. It's not me. I mean, there's part of them is me. It's part of the, that kid. It's this, this unexplainable things in the air that this country has. That if it damages, that would be the probably the most, um, it would be the saddest thing. And I wish I could explain not to touch that one. Because you can always build the road. You can always do this. But that one, China cannot do that. It, it can't do the skies and all that. So that worries me really a lot. And, and that's why I start telling the stories of, of things. And, and that's why we start going into the, all the other entrepreneurs and say, you, you got to do the same thing. You got to do the same thing. You got to do the same thing. One, one thing that I am always amazed in here is that how things go up and then come down and do this and then how it becomes okay. Uh, and this, this goes down into the survival things, I think. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a sociologist, but I look at from my own experience is from factory closing to factory becoming that place the general behavior is like it's ups and downs, but it's very stable. Wonderful. Well, and it's amazing. Uh, I'm getting the signal that we are out of time. So, right. Hamdi, on behalf of the American people, I want to thank you for giving <laughs> us a chance and for the yogurt. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.